Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this edition of the NITEX mini school on machine learning, application of machine learning to the high energy physics. And today is the second lecture of the school. In the first lecture, uh, Mishnu gave us a very good overview of application of the machine learning to the so, uh, certain problems in the high energy physics. And today, what we're going to go, we're going to go a little bit more into nitty gritty of the things, and we're going to talk about the mathematics of the machine learning. And uh, Mishnu is going to introduce to us the speaker, Mishnu. So we're very happy to have him here, Bit Mukherjee. Uh, he did his uh, PhD at Johns Hopkins, uh, and then in 2020, and since then, he's been uh, at the Department of Statistics in, uh, in the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. So he'll tell us about recent progress in mathematics and machine learning. So please, go ahead. Thanks a lot for the arrangement. Uh, I hope I'm audible. So I will, the work that I'm going to present, most of it is, uh, have, most of it happened with my advisor, Amitabh Basu, and uh, various collaborators. Most recently, Professor Shayor at University of Florida Statistics, Professor Veji at Watnan and Panidhi at Amazon India. So this is supposed to be a tutorial talk, so I'm not in any hurry to cover everything that uh, is there in the slides. Feel free to stop, ask more questions. The idea is uh, tutorial, not a research seminar. So, okay. So let's, I don't know how familiar everybody in the audience is with neural networks, but uh, if somebody's never seen a neural network before, so this is a good picture to keep in mind. So what you see on your screen is the simplest example of a neural network. It takes two inputs and the green dots, X1 and X2, and it's like a computation graph, and you read it from left to right. And the first blue dot at the top is computing maximum of zero comma, the sum of the inputs, X1 plus X2. And that's what's denoted by one being written on the edges of the incoming edges. The second blue dot has minus one and minus one incoming edges. So that means it's computing the output of max of zero comma minus one, minus X1, minus X2. Yeah, uh, the, and so on and so forth. And the red dot is a summing gate. So it sums the, it computes a weighted sum of the outputs of the blue gates. And you can see the weights are given as half, minus half, half and half. So it weights the output of the first blue gate by half, the output of the second blue gate by minus half, and so on, and adds them up. So if you follow the computation graph from left to right, you can convince yourself that this uh, network is computing the maximum of two numbers. So this kind of neural networks, which compute the max of two numbers, are theoretically very important. So in 2016, when we first started out trying to prove such theorems, uh, we used this max function construction pretty heavily to show theorems of this kind. Like a, a very important structure theorem is that every continuous piecewise linear function is actually a neural network of depth log n. So what is the depth of a neural network? My convention is that depth is a distance from the input to the output. So for the network you see on the screen, it's a depth two neural network because the blue gate to the red gate, it's a distance of two. You need to cover two edges to get from the blue to the, to get from the green to the red. So one important structure theorem about neural networks is that the set of all neural networks of this type is exactly the same as a set of all continuous piecewise linear functions. More fine-grained questions can be asked, but that's a different direction of research. Like if you fix the depth, what exactly are those piecewise linear functions? That kind of questions get harder and harder, and that's a different direction of research, which I am not getting into here. But overall, this is the most important, one basic thing one needs to keep in mind. So the question is, uh, more formally, how do we state this? So more formally, we think in terms of the activation function. What you saw is the blue gates. So the most common activation function, or may I say the most useful activation function is the rectified linear unit. It takes an n-dimensional vector as input and it gives another n-dimensional vector as output by computing max of zero comma each of the coordinates. So the ith coordinate of the output is max of zero comma ith coordinate of the input. And this has historically now become the most dominant form of activation function because it is the most performance-wise, it is essentially the best out there. For most things that you want to do with a neural net, this activation does the best. So most theory is written tuned to the ReLU. So a class of neural nets that I would say is general enough for most theoretical purposes is what I call 
called a feed forward neural networks. So what is a feed forward neural network? It's a class of functions of, the, of a depth k plus one, let's say, which can be written as a composition of affine transforms and ReLU's alternative with each other. So A1 is the affine transform that's acting on the input, input vector. On the output of the A1 affine transform, you apply the ReLU. On the output of the ReLU, you apply the A2 affine transform, and you keep doing it k plus one times. The number of affine transforms in this function is the depth of the neural network. So I had defined for the graph point of view, I had defined depth as the distance from the input to the output. You can convince yourself that written as a graph, the distance from the input to the output notion of depth is the same as in this way of thinking, depth being the number of affine transforms in the function. Uh, and what, some people would define the width of a neural network also. The width would be the largest dimension of any affine transform in this sequence. So I require k plus one affine transforms to define a k plus one depth neural network. And these affine transforms could be of various different output dimensions and input dimensions. The internal A1s could just map any dimension to any dimension internally. The largest input dimension, largest input or output dimension of any affine transform in the sequence would be called the width of the neural network. And the sum of the dimension would be the size of the network. So one important thing to keep in mind is that one might ask, is this the most general neural network? And I said, and I'll make that very clear that this is not. There are very sophisticated neural networks out there that are increasingly getting used, which do not fit this definition. And those are way more harder. Theory, theory for them is way more harder, and we are not going in that direction. But this is general enough to be capturing almost everything non-trivial. Mathematically, whatever non-trivial non question you want to ask can possibly be asked within this framework already. So the question is, why are these uh, functions so interesting, and why has it become a trillion dollar industry? Why it has never before probably happened that a certain function class is a trillion dollar industry. So why is so much money running on this? The question, one way to understand is experiments like this. I always like to show this experiment because it's, I think, one of the most fascinating neural experiments out there. So what you see on the screen are not photographs of any real human beings, but these outputs of neural networks. So it was possible to find out the affine transforms A1 to AK plus one such that when you feed to the neural network a random Gaussian vector, the output was a realistic human face. So essentially, the neural network can be used as a sampler of realistic human face images. And to my mind, that's extremely fascinating. How is it possible that we could imagine human faces as a distribution and then create a neural network which essentially samples human faces at random? And why was it possible to find such affine transforms at all easily enough? And it is not that hard to find the affine transforms. The algorithms are not that complicated either, given what it's achieving. And this kind of experiments get someone like me very excited to understand, like, why is it happening? So we need, to, we need a mathematical formalism to ask this kind of questions. And that is the idea of the risk function. So this is the most common language to think about neural networks is in the language of the risk function. So let me define what is a risk function. Suppose there is a distribution D and I have a finite set of samples S, uh, samples S taken for sample from the distribution. And I have given a neural function in, and suppose script L, what you see a script L on the screen is what I would call a loss function. It's a bivariate function. It takes two vectors as input, a vector Y, and the output of the neural network in on the input x. So you take x, is x comma y is a sample of the distribution. You feed x into the input, x as input into the neural network, and look at its output, which is n of x. L computes typically a non-negative real number from y and n of x. The most common example would be of L y comma nx would be norm y minus nx squared. That's the most so squared law distance between squared L2 norm between Y and N of X is the most common example of script L. And that is what is called the L2 loss. But L2 loss is not the most uh, predominant loss that is used because people often want to use neural nets in certain contexts, but L2 loss is often, it's a bit of a debate as whether it's best or not. So, but L2 loss is not the only loss. There are various, various weird losses out there which people use. And that's a, one of the most active areas of research is to find out with find out good losses. How do you know what L to pick so that you have the best performance that you want? 
So that's a very important direction of research. Designing these ELs is very tricky. Or some people would want to say that given the objective, you want to theoretically derive the L out of it. So that's what a lot of research goes into. But for any choice of L, now you can compute expectation of this loss over samples of X comma Y. If the expectation is being taken over the total distribution, D, then I would call it the risk function, which is LDN on the screen. And if I'm taking the expectation over a uniform distribution, which is supported only on the finite data set that is sampled, then I would call it the empirical risk function, which is LS cap N. And understanding the relationship between LS cap N and LDN forms the crux of the mathematics, I would say. A lot of things that you want to prove about LDN, we often prove about LSN and then try to show that the statement approximately, almost approximately holds for LDN. And how do you go from theorems about LS cap N to LDN is where most of the hard maths is. At least I would say half the hard maths is about coming up with relationships between LS cap N to LDN. And this is very, very subtle. Uh, okay. I would like to introduce here the notation of a landscape. Uh, the way I've, the way the blue equation has been framed on the screen, n is a fixed function, is a fixed neural network. But often we want to think of not, often we want to think of LS as a function of n, where n varies over different neural functions representable on a fixed architecture. We is the same as saying I fix the computation graph and I vary the weights. If I'm varying the weights in the computation graph, I'm varying the neural function n. So as I'm varying the neural function n, I'm going to get different numbers LS cap n or LDN. So risk function thought of as a real valued function on the space of neural functions would often be called the landscape of the neural network, the landscape of the architecture. So it's often useful to think in terms of the landscape rather than in terms of fixed n. The crux of the deep learning theory is to come up with, come up with principled ways of choosing these three important parts, n, d, and l. The three important players in this game is n, d, and l. And we want to understand how do you choose these three data, n, d, and l, such that neural nets n of low risk for which this LDN value will be small can be easily found. And that's what all neural net experiments tell us, that it just so happens the real world is somehow so that it is easy to find the neural nets n so that the LDN function is a very low value. So if it's a positive, if it's a non-negative function, you can essentially hit zero. You can essentially find n where LDN is equal to zero, essentially. Machine precision. You can get down to machine precision. So, so that's the big question in deep learning. Why is it easy to find these functions n so that LDN is LDN is a low number? To get a feel of why this should not be easy a priori, let us look at an example of LDN. So what you see on the screen is an actual two-dimensional projection of what the risk function looks like. And you, have, you see two diagrams on the screen. You should agree that the diagram on the right is somewhat simpler landscape to optimize over. By optimize, I here mean that you want to find the lowest point in the landscape, the neural net where the loss value is the lowest, which is the dark blue point in each of the two diagrams. You should agree that the right one is somewhat easier. It should be easier to find the dark blue point in the right-hand picture than the left-hand picture. But if you open up the neural network, you realize that where these diagrams come from, there's a very famous paper from a couple of years ago where they did this analysis. The two neural nets actually differ very little. So this is part of the, this is one of the important parts of the game. The architecture design is very critical to your ability to find a low risk net. Small changes in the architecture can cause dramatic changes in how the landscape looks like. And that can totally uh, determine whether the problem is at all any more tractable or not. And if you're stuck in the left picture, particularly, where there is like, it's essentially like a mountain range out there, there are premises, there are valleys, there are all sorts of topographic features in the landscape, then starting at an arbitrary point in this landscape, why should going to the dark blue point ever be easy problem? So that's the mathematical mystery. How is it that we have so easy algorithms which get to the dark blue point when the landscape is so complicated? Okay, so, and but now the question is, I, I had already hinted at this earlier that the real challenge in the real, uh, the challenge in the real world often is to come up with the right loss function, which is to say that 
diverse real life learning problems like people want to drive automated cars can essentially be framed as a risk minimization question and that is part of the design problem that how do you frame the question of self driving cars as a risk minimization problem and that's part of the engineering that happens and over and over again we have seen that this is possible diverse real life problems can be cast as optimization questions over deep learning landscapes and that's the reason why this is seen now one way to particular way to frame the question that is uh, very relevant particular for, uh, for the purpose of mathematical uh, advancement is to say that i am not going to think of the very weirdly general case of x comma y being samples of some distribution d but i'm going to rather think of there being a generative function f often called the generative model f such that your y is a noisy version of the evaluation of f of x so i'm not sampling joint i'm not sampling x comma y pairs from a joint distribution just like that i'm essentially sampling x and then i'm looking at y being an evaluation of the some fixed function f on x if i'm restricting myself to distribution to data generation mechanisms of this type then the natural question often is to come up with a neural network architecture such that lowest point in that landscape is very is a function is a neural function which is very close to the hidden function small f so essentially then the problem becomes by looking at samples of the data x comma y can you find a very good approximation of the generative function f and this is i would say the most predominant way of writing theory at this point almost like a vast number of theories written in this language where there is a generative model f and we want to figure out can we train a neural net to recover f from samples of x comma y and way too many important questions can be framed like that and there is overwhelming experimental evidence that for there is a large class of fs out there for which this is possible and very there is very little of theoretical progress about understanding why you can actually do this so in 2018 we gave one of the some of the first proofs towards this uh, question uh, in the classic context of what we call sparse coding so i'm not going into the details of what is the sparse coding problem but essentially we should understand sparse coding problem is a special case when the f in the second box here is a linear transformation then so f is a linear transformation a very special kind of special kinds of linear transformations then we showed why this should be possible we gave some arguments over why this should be possible it's a very complicated calculation and then there's a result uh, by in my hegde's group in new york university who were able to show that gradient descent in fact will discover the f in this case where f is restricted to be special kinds of linear functions so that's the theory is so it's already takes an enormous effort to prove that you can come up with neural network architectures whose lowest point in the landscape is a function very close to f this kind of proof is already very hard to write even for the cases where f is a linear function and a very special class of linear functions are required to be able to write those proofs and being able to write a, uh, such proofs for non linear f is still pretty open i would say like there are very restrictive classes of f f for which now we have some results in last two years uh, this has happened but there are very very restrictive classes of f but we believe it is possible for many large classes of f and that's a very active area of research to figure out what generative models can be recovered through neural optimization but the question i want to focus on here is the algorithms which actually find this find this low risk next almost all algorithms at this point look like what you see on the screen what they do is they start with a random assignment of weights on the neural network let's call it w1 and then they make updates on w1 with steps w1 w2 w3 and this updates are essentially like taking gradient of the risk function and adding a noise to it there are various ways of adding noise to the gradient of the risk function i am abstracting that that all out by some number xi t by some vector xi t here where xi t is a random vector there are multiple ways of adding noise to the uh, to the gradient of the risk function and this risk functions we should understand is neither convex nor smooth so they are not differentiable everywhere they are not convex so how do you write this kind of a gradient descent algorithm with non smooth non convex functions and that is the crux of the mathematical challenge here 
And uh, these are what we call the subdifferential descent algorithms. Almost everything that is working in the neural world at this point are this kind of stochastic subdifferential descents. And this is a very easy algorithm if you think about it. Uh, and we uh, have. So, so, sorry, Anir. Yes. So can you maybe take into account that maybe not everybody is familiar? Can you tell two words what when you're saying non-smooth, non-convex functions? What do you mean? So that, that the okay. students can follow a little bit better. OK, uh, good. Thank you. So uh, what I mean by that, OK, let's uh, have a quick review of what is a convex function. Essentially, a convex function is a, the most typical convex function you should keep in your mind is that of a parabola. So the most important property about a way to think about it is that if you take two points on the parabola and you connect them by a chord, then the entire parabola hangs below the chord. And this is the key property of a convex function. That if you take any chord, uh, chord in the graph, then the function hangs below the chord. And these functions are called convex functions. A parabola is a good example to keep in mind. Uh, e to the power of x is another example of a convex function. If you take any chord across e to the power of x, the function is below that. And Understanding descent algorithms, this kind of gradient descent algorithms and convex functions is way easier than when the function does not have this convexity property. And that is how the mathematics at this point is. Uh, it is just way easier. Like it's incomparably easy to do gradient descent analysis when you have convexity and when you don't have convexity. Now, what is a non-smoothness? By non-smoothness, I mean that the function is not differentiable everywhere. To give a simple example of a non-smooth function, consider y equal to mod x. So y equal to mod x has an edge at x equal to 0. So the function is y equal to mod x is differentiable everywhere except at the origin. And if you have many such edge points in the function's graph, it's non-differentiable at more and more number of points. And having this kind of edges where the differentiability is lost makes very hard to analyze gradient descents because, firstly, there is no notion of a gradient at those points. Then what do you do? How do you define a gradient descent when the function is not differentiable everywhere? That's a very important direction of uh, mathematics that one has to understand. That's what is called as defining a subdifferential. There are there is no unique notion of a subdifferential. There are multiple notions of a subdifferential that can be written down for general, more and more general function classes. And there are cases where they will coincide. There are cases where they will not. And it gets into the whole difficulty about it. All deep learning software out there currently, TensorFlow, PyTorch, have internally inside them a way to choose the subdifferential. So now the deep learning community essentially has, it has essentially agreed that there are certain subdifferential functions. Essentially, there are certain mechanisms of writing down the derivative of a non of a function which is not differentiable everywhere, which seem to work the best. So all softwares out there inside them implement the subdifferential algorithm using a convention. So when you implement a subdifferential algorithm, you have to have a convention about what is your gradient definition at the non-smooth points. And that is uh, the issue with non-smoothness. But neural networks, is an, are, uh, one way to say why neural network theory is so difficult is because both the properties are working together against you. You neither have convexity, nor do you have differentiability. Now what do you even just differentiable non-convex functions is already a hard problem on its own. Theory for that is already difficult, like to understand why does gradient descent, when, when would gradient descent work on smooth non-convex functions is a very difficult theory on its own. But now you have another challenge. You know neither have smoothness. You also do not have smoothness. So that's the complicated, that's to understand, way to understand where neural networks difficulty comes from. Okay. So, I would say the most profound mystery of deep learning is this, to understand why is this obvious simple algorithm of subdifferential descent so often converging to the global minimum of this complicated function. And that is the central challenge of deep learning. To give an example of a simple, ex a simple example in contrast, when it is not so hard to understand this kind of descent, let me give an example of doing it on the parabola as I was saying. Suppose fx equal to x square. What is the gradient descent algorithm on fx equal to x square? That would be xt plus 1 equal to xt minus eta. Eta is my step length, some positive uh, number. xt plus 1 equal to xt minus eta into gradient of f at xt. That would be my gradient descent algorithm. 
you can convince yourself that the iterates of this algorithm will be x t plus one equal to x t minus two eta x t. This is a recursion. Needed a decent algorithm with a recursion. And this dynamical system can be solved. You can exactly write down the solution of the dynamical system because you can unwrap the recursion and you can write that the xn, the nth step, can be explicitly written as a function in terms of the first, initial, first point of the algorithm x1 into 1 minus 2 eta to the power of n minus 1. So I can exactly solve this recursion for the parabola. And hence I, hence I can read off, once I know the nth step as a function of n explicitly, I can easily read off that in t equal to order log 1 over epsilon steps, xn will be epsilon close to the global minimum of x squared that is 0. So here is a one-line proof of why gradient descent should work on the simplest function out there, the parabola. And this is, I would say, a template for how one would have ideally wanted to write down a gradient descent proofs for neural networks. That fx is not x squared, but fx is the risk. fx is this entire big function out here. So, and but we can't. This kind of simple, simple two-line arguments to see why gradient descent should asymptotically go to the global minima of a function is possible only when you have such simple functions like fx equal to x squared. And this kind of trivial algorithm, trivial arguments, won't is not enough at this point to tell us why this method should go to the global minima of a complicated function. And that's the challenge. Okay, so what do in general stochastic subdifferential methods look like? I, feel I would like to say more, some more things about it. So in general, they don't actually do gradient descent. What happens in deep learning software is not really gradient descent. It's not even just subdifferential descent. They will effect essentially do xt plus one to xt minus xt minus eta into vt, where vt is a vector which in the simple cases is an approximation of the gradient of f. Like if f is not differentiable everywhere, vt might be a subdifferential of it, some notion of subdifferential, et cetera, or noisy stochastic gradient of it. But in general, this vt could be a very complicated vector that the algorithm is coming up with. This is something to keep in mind. Gradient descent is a very good thing to analyze. It's already mathematically challenging for non-smooth, non-convex functions. But actual deep learning is not really doing gradient descent. I mean, if you just do vanilla gradient descent, deep learning is not going to really work. Actual VT that is used, actual vector VT that is used in the state of the art implementations is a very complicated thing. These vectors are essentially functions of every iterate seen till date. So the tth VT is a function of x1, x2, x3, xt minus one. So this is kind of very adaptive, they're called adaptive methods. So where the every, at every iterate, the direction of update is a nonlinear, complicated nonlinear function of all iterates seen till date. That's what actually happens. And these are very complicated functions. So, but well, that's the bigger challenge. Okay, we already don't know how to analyze gradient descent or non spoon non convex functions. Doing it when adaptivity is into play makes it even harder. And that's how things get more complicated. But still, these are local search algorithms because at any time you're, say, it's a, it's, it's a, a XT update is essentially, I would still call it a local search algorithm. And the mystery of deep learning can be framed as saying, we, now we have a whole class of local search algorithms, which are easy to implement and they're surprisingly fast convergent on weirdly complicated functions that neither differentiability nor convex. And that is the challenge to explain that. So, okay. So people, mathematicians have thought a lot about trying to understand this kind of, method, uh, this kind of uh, processes. So I want to highlight two research results recently of the, in the last couple of years, which have made uh, some significant progress in this direction of understanding the general theory. So there was this paper in 2018 by Damik Davis, Dzwayevsky, Shamkakri, and James Lee, uh, Jason Lee, uh, who showed that there is a large class of functions they were able to identify, non-pathological functions, uh, some of which is, uh, they were able to identify this whole class of non-school, non-convex functions, such that they were able to show that subdifferential descent would asymptotically go to a stationary point. So that's the most general result I know that exists at this point. This paper, this very important paper was able to identify that. And their class of functions does include neural nets as a special case. And so you can see how hard it is that we want to show that subdifferential descent goes to the global minima. Whereas the state of the art theory in general is that asymptotically you get to the stationary point, get to some stationary point. The stationary point could as well be a saddle point. 
and we, we don't know how to prove it anything anything much better in general and the key idea behind this kind of proofs was to generalize the idea of a differential equation so what they said that we should think not in terms of so you can think of gradient descents as being discretization of certain ods but what is a sub differential descent to discretization of so they define this class of things called differential inclusion equations so differential inclusion equations is a generalization of the idea of a differential equation and where you say that dz dt is a vector which at every point has to be an element of the sub negative sub differential set of the function at z of the sub differentials are not unique at every point z t you get a entire set of sub differentials which is called del f of z t and they said consider this system in this way that at every point the derivative of z is some element in the sub differential set now can you analyze this kind of quote and put differential equations which are set value so these are like differential equations are differential operators are typically vector values so what if you had differential equations where the differential operator is set value and they had to think in that language a set value differential equations and they were able to show that Uh, for nice enough functions, you can get asymptotically to stationary point. So that's the most general result that is provable so far. If you allow me to make some more assumptions, uh, in 2019, uh, two people of the same group were able to show Damian Davis and Druzhbarsky were able to get non-asymptotic guarantees of getting to the local minima for a slightly weaker class of functions, which is called weakly convex non-smooth functions. So I'm not getting into the detail of what is a weakly convex function, but Point to remember is that it's I don't think there's any neural net out there which is weakly convex. So this result, when we try to get get to when we try to improve from asymptotically getting stationary points to non-asymptotic guarantees to getting local minima, we already lose out neural net for stationary. So that's the state of the art in general. So the moral of the story is that the complexity of proofs in the general functions. general non smooth non convex functions is pretty high to write this kind of dynamical system proof if you want to call it these are essentially dynamical system proofs is quite complicated but despite the complexity they do not capture much of anything of what's happening in the deep learning software so what's happening inside the software and why they keep succeeding so often is way outside the reach of state of the art of to the best of my knowledge what is state of the art of general theory out there which is people like I would strongly encourage everyone to read these papers uh, because they are very important mathematical progresses. But we must understand that getting from these state of the art to actual proofs of deep learning is a huge gap. Yeah. It's a big gap. So we write we want to write proofs specific to neural functions. That's how sort of the literature gets motivated. That okay, in general, this is what you can achieve. But if you have fix my proofs to neural functions, can I get something better? so one of the things that we showed in 2016 was that suppose i do not do some differential gradient based algorithm uh it's true that gradient based algorithm is the most predominant way of doing deep learning and they are successful wildly successful but suppose i don't do them can i prove something better so we were able to show that the general risk minimization problem which is this on the screen but you can see this minimization problem over all the weights of the neural network over an average over the s data points of the squared loss on data x i comma y i being the training data from this general uh, depth two network there is a depth two network because there is a single layer of activation we ask the question that can we get to the global minima of this by some method whether it doesn't have to be graded is there any method that gets to the global minima at all and we were able to find one so in 2016 we showed that there is a method that gets to the global minima but it requires a time which is exponential in input dimension and the width of the network And in 2020, there was a result uh, by a group in Texas, Austin, who proved that this 2016 result of ours is essentially optimal. It's nearly optimal now, known to be nearly optimal. So there is not much you can improve here. There is some improvement possible. I think you can decrease the s to a constant. I think now, but it's still exponential in width and input dimension. So in general, and this kind of result is still, to the best of my knowledge, not really known for any other net apart from depth two network. But depth three networks. one can still ask the question is there a method which gets to the global minima of a depth three network by any amount of time i let you run the algorithm for whatever amount of time can you probably get to the global minima 
I do not know if such a thing that is unknown. Probably it's known, but I'm not entirely sure. So this is one end of the research. Since 2018, another direction of research which has become very, very predominant is, uh, is this was started by results by Alan Zhu, Lisa Lee and Song, Simon Dubetal, Chen Chen et al. at UCLA. What they realize is that suppose we decide to work on neural nets which are asymptotically large. What does asymptotically large here mean? It means that the width of the neural network is a, poly, is a large polynomial in the sample size, the training data size and one over epsilon. The epsilon is your target accuracy. How close you want to the global minima. If you want to get epsilon close to the global minima, use a neural net whose size is one over epsilon to the power of 30. That's the kind of numbers we're talking about here. This huge neural nets. If you work in that limit, where your size of the net scales inversely with the accuracy you want, then they were able to show that stochastic subdifferential methods actually converge to the global minima in log one over epsilon time. So this is a sort of an extreme kind of a result, family of results, where you are able to prove the standard algorithms converge very fast, but at the cost of working on neural networks, which are unrealistically large. And this has captured the attention of the community, like I would say it's a wildfire at this point. Like there are, I think, 300 papers per day or something like that getting written on this, uh, this scheme now. And if you take the neural net, asymptotically large, you can start proving all sorts of things about neural network which you cannot prove anywhere in any other regime. So they started this from 20, late 2018, this sort of started, this way of writing proof. But as you can see that these two results on the screen are like two ends of the spectrum. On one hand, I have enormous amount of time required to prove, get to global minima of finite for finitely large neural networks. And on the other end of the spectrum, I have theories, theorems like these, where you can very fast get to approximate global minima, but at the cost of using neural nets, which are weirdly large. So theory is stuck essentially at these two ends of the spectrum, and the real world is somewhere in the middle. And that's where things get complicated. So to give an example, explicit example, uh, consider what you see on the screen in the first box is a risk function on a simplest neural net out there. What is the simplest neural net out there? Which is a max single max function max of zero comma inner product of W and X. It takes X as an input, takes the inner product with W, does max of zero comma the inner product, and then I'm doing squared loss against the label Y. And I want to get to the global minima of this risk function. What is the standard subdifferential descent that I can write on this risk function to get to the global minima? Which is that at time T, you sample XT comma YT from some distribution T. You pick an eta T, a step length, eta T greater than zero. And you do a weight update, where the weight update looks like WT plus one into WT minus eta T into, into a vector, which you, will, you can convince yourself that it's like a gradient. It's not exactly the gradient, but it's a most reasonable notion of a gradient you could have written down in the max function. Out there. Max is not differentiable everywhere, so you have to deal with it. And this is the standard way how softwares deal with it. All softwares internally will implement this algorithm if you give it the simplest neural net to work on. And the question arises, okay, so where is WT heading? If I keep doing this, where is WT eventually going? What is the asymptotic uh, value of the weight if I keep doing, keep running this dynamical system? Answer is we don't. But even for the simplest neural net in general, we do not know where the, where the iterates head towards. Unless you make very specific assumptions about the distribution D. And that's where we are stuck in theory. If you, once you go to, once you try proving subdifferential descent, on finitely large neural networks, like this simplest example on the screen, you have to immediately, you have to make very strong assumptions about what distribution D looks like, so that you can tell me something about where the iterates are asymptotically going. In general, we have nearly no idea. We essentially have don't, we don't have an idea. And that's like, gives you a flavor of what the hard problems are. If someone can solve this question, I would say that would be a very important progress. If someone can show a general class of distributions D, for which the asymptotic value of WT is, can be computed out. That would be a very important class of that. And so in the, I would say that proof of credibility is essentially open for large classes of networks out there. Uh, in 2020, we focused a lot writing proofs of this kind, where we say, okay, we have got all these three properties to hold in our proofs simultaneously. We want the neural network to be finitely large, no asymptotically large nets. We want the data to be non-realizable. 
So, in 2020, we focused on writing proofs of this kind, where we said that we want three properties out of a good proof. What should a good neural net proof look like? I believe we should have three properties. Left. One, the network should be finitely large, no asymptotically large limits on the neural network size. Uh, second, we want the data to be non realizable. What I mean by non realizable data is that the Y should not be output of the same neural architecture on different weights on the X. And we want the algorithm to resemble SGD, which has some different field effect. Even if it is not exactly SGD, even if proving the theorem for exact SGD is difficult, we want to prove the theorems to for some algorithm which at least look as close as possible to some different field effect. So can you write proofs of this kind? I would say this is the central challenge at this point. Uh, how do you write such proofs? So I will show one example I can show. So follow, follow your video. Hello. Hello. Can you see the video? Okay. Okay. So I would like to show one example of when such a thing is possible. Just focus here on this red line, which says what the label YT looks like. The YT I'm looking at, I'm looking at is looks like output of a single ReLU gate on some weight W star using some weight W star at the data point XT plus an additive distortion. And this distortion is probabilistic. As in at every time T, at every time T, I am sampling B data points, so T1 to TB. And for every data point, I'm allowing the label to be dis the true label to be additively distorted by alpha ti into xi ti, where xi ti is a bundle random variable. Uh, sorry, alpha ti is a bundle random variable, and xi ti is some number which is bounded by theta star. The theta star is some constant. So I'm doing a probabilistic bounded adversarial perturbation to the true labels of a single cell. And I'm asking that in this semi realizable setting, let's call it, can I get the gradient descent algorithm? To get a very close to W star, or how close to W star can I get? And this kind of question, uh, answering this kind of question for subdifferential descent is actually very complicated. We still don't know how to do that. But if I make a slight change to the subdifferential descent definition, where I change the indicator, you might have realized that there was an indicator here. When I wrote the indicator, wrote the subdifferential on a single gate. You see what the indicator was on. It was the indicator on the inner product of WT and XT. So the indicator acts on the current weight WT. But suppose I change the indicator slightly to act on the current label YTI. If I make a small shift in the indicators where the indicator is working, then I'm actually able to get convergence. In the sense, I can now prove that the iterates WT are eventually going to get close to W star. And I can prove how close they can get. I can give guarantees on how close, how close I will recover W star. So this is a very important way to think about neural network proofs. That even when the algorithm that you actually want to prove might be outside the mathematical reach, you can try to show that a slight modification to the algorithm maybe makes the entire proof work. Maybe I, I suddenly get enormous mathematical control on what's going on. that makes slight distortions to the algorithm. And this, I believe, is a very important philosophy of doing this kind of research going ahead. That take hard algorithms out there, which we don't know how to analyze, but maybe you can find, maybe you can open up the software, look at the hard algorithms which are working inside it, which we don't know how to mathematically analyze, but maybe you can do this kind of stuff that makes small changes in the algorithm, which, certain, which will still preserve most of the properties and will still be proven. And I believe this is an important way to think about neural network proofs. And Proof of the pudding is here. What you see on the left is the trajectory of the algorithm. Uh, by trajectory, I mean I'm computing how far is the iterate from the global minima W star, from the original global minima W star. And you can see how close I can get to it within 2000 iterations for different values of theta star. So theta, the brown curve, uh, the blue curve is when theta star is uh, nearly zero. So I can get very close to W star, the original weight. And as I keep increasing the distortion value, I can be, I am not able to get as far. I'm sort of gracefully degrading my approach. But what is key to notice here is the left plot here comes from my slightly changed subdifferential descent, while the right plot is actual subdifferential descent. 
which is running in the software. So if you give this problem on a standard software, you will get the right plot. Whereas my algorithm produces the left plot. And you should agree with me that the two plots are nearly identical. And that's the key point I want to make. So what the softwares are running can be essentially be reproduced by another algorithm, which is slightly different. But that slight difference I'm causing by hand is enough to make this provable while this has no guarantee. While this for this sub differential descent, I have no idea what the proof is. Nobody knows, probably nobody knows how to write a proof for this. And this can be robustly tested against even the probability of attack. I was doing a probabilistic distortion to the true labels. I show that if you make the probability of attack larger and smaller as I keep varying, my approach to the true global minima it degrades or improves accordingly. And again, the right plot is the true sub differential descent, and the left plot is my modified sub differential descent. And again, I, you see that the modification I did by hand did not damage the trajectory too much. The graphs are nearly identical, while the left one is provable and the right one is not. So I would encourage people to think in this language that maybe this is not a one off case. Maybe this is a way to think about deep learning going ahead. Take the hard algorithms, make small changes in it so that the performance and the behavior almost remains identical. But if you can find the change to make smartly enough, then maybe the proof will become, maybe the algorithm will suddenly become provable. And I think that's an important way to think about these questions. Okay. At this point, I'm going to take a diversion into a different way of doing, different issue of deep learning. So, so far, what I've talked about is about tracking the weights of the neural network, how the weights change during sub differential descent. And this Although it has been a very fruitful direction of research, one might say that it is maybe there's a limitation to how far you can push this kind of proof. Like, can you really hope that the trillion dimensional neural networks that are actually running in the real world, things like BERT and all, the, one of the largest neural nets running, I think, has 1.8 trillion parameters, largest neural net that is currently working in the world. So, if you have 1.8 trillion dimensional stochastic subdifferential descent you want to analyze, like, is that really possible? I mean, many people are pessimistic about it. So, and for good reasons. And neural network architectures keep getting more and more complicated. How far can you push these proofs in the general scenario? It's, there's reason to be skeptical about it. So, we want to say can we, can we have a phenomenological approach to neural deep learning? So, what I mean by phenomenological approach is we are all physicists here. I am a X is student. So is I would say Navier-Stokes equation. It's a good example to keep in mind. Navier-Stokes equation gives you a PD, which is a very good model of how fluid behaves at large scales. And it sees the fluid through only three parameters, pressure, density, and viscosity. That's it. I don't need to know Schrodinger's equation of every atom inside the fluid to know how the water behaves at large scale. You cannot start from atomic theory of water molecules and from there derive Navier-Stokes. And this, this has never happened to the best of my knowledge. But if you abstract out the water's properties into three numbers, just three numbers, you can write a PD, which apparently is a very good model of how water behaves at large scale. And we want to say that maybe, maybe neural networks have a picture like that. Maybe you need not think of neural networks in the microscopic level of tracking how every weight is evolving in time, but rather maybe there's a way to abstract out what the neural network is doing in terms of some small number of parameters, and then write a differential equation which globally tells you how the neural network should behave over time, which is fairly accurate. Maybe this approach is possible. And the question is, what are such parameters? Are there such universal parameters which are which have some universal behavior across neural networks? Which can play the role, play, which can, which can sort of be the beginning point of such a philosophy. I would say that there is a good guess at this point. So this guess came in 2020 by uh, Hang Feng He and Wei Ji Su. So what they said was, let's look at this function. What they said was, look at this function. Suppose f here is the neural network class you're training over. It doesn't have to be a neural network. This statement is pretty general here. The definition is pretty general. Suppose F is the neural network you're training over. And suppose W1, W2, W3, W4, W3, W4, W5 is the sequence of iterates of the neural network during the training. 
what I want to do is, given the training sequence to me, suppose somebody gives me the training sequence, I want to insert a probe inside the training sequence, ask the following question. See at the bottom of the screen, what is called the definition of WT plus. What is WT plus? WT plus X is saying that when the weight was WT, suppose you did a gradient step using the data X comma Y. Maybe you actually did not use the data X comma Y to go from WT to WT plus one. The actual algorithm went from WT to WT plus one using some mechanism, which I don't know. But suppose I went to WT to WT plus X using a simple gradient descent using at the data point X comma Y. If I did this fictitious step at WT, I'm asking how much does the function values change at the point X prime, where X prime is a different point than X. And I'm dividing that by how much does the prediction of the function change at the point X itself, where X is the point that was used to make the update. Essentially, this is saying, if I make the update at WT using the data X, how much does that change the prediction at X prime? And this should remind the physics audience of Green's function. This is some sort of an idea of two-point correlations. I don't have a mathematical way to exactly relate this function to what is called two-point correlation functions in physics, but I believe there is, at a very heuristic level at least, there is a way to think of it that, in that language. So you're asking, how much does the prediction change at X prime when the date sample data is X? And this behavior across two, this two-point behavior of neural training has a very systematic, uh, has very systematic properties as we have now realized, as I have now realized over the last, uh, I and my friends have realized over the last uh, five, seven months of experimentation. So what we are seeing is that it is local. One of the things is that this training behavior is local. What I mean by local is, you, if when you sample the data X, the functions predictions, do not change too much at points which are very far from the sample data. It only makes changes in a neighborhood of the X. And which is, which might be surprising if you are used to thinking of linear functions. Because in linear functions, this is not true. A linear function distorts globally for any change. If you make, if you start doing a gradient descent on a linear function, then every data point is capable of changing the function's values very largely at far away points. But that's not how neural networks. Neural networks are really nonlinear. It's extremely nonlinear, and the, and one way to understand the nonlinearity is by through this effect of locality. That you cannot affect the prediction at faraway points by sampling by any sample data. And this can be seen in this left graph that where you see that we are plotting this SRL function that we call it as a function of the distance. And you see the distance as you sample farther and farther away, the dis this effect of SRL essentially falls. And this is essentially a timing variant. And you can smoothen these graphs out, you can average over and smooth the graphs out and you'll see a very nice fall. And this is time invariant. At the initial part of the training, as well as the late part of the training, this locality never disappears. It's always a local change. The second is for a fixed pair of points, if I fix the pair of points X and X prime, I see that this relative change has a very nice structure. It has an initial phase where it rapidly rises. So initially during training, neural networks affect, affect the X prime because of data X is changing very fast, it's increasing. But very soon it stabilizes. It stabilizes into a somewhat large value. Uh, sometimes it may not actually stabilize, it may keep increasing at a very slight rate forever. That might also keep happening. But there is this two-phase behavior. And this is like essentially like phase transition. One might, one might think of it like a phase transition. The neural network training happens in two phases. Phase one, when the elasticity behavior, what I call the local elasticity, is rapidly rising. And a stage two or a phase two, when local elasticity has essentially stabilized or is mildly increased. And uh, here we say, uh, this is a bit of a different issue I'm not getting into. Uh, it, uh, it, I just quickly say that the behavior of local elasticity correlates to the loss function search uh, dynamics. Like when the loss function is uh, falling rapidly in the initial phase, that coincides with the phase when local elasticity is rising. And the later half when the 
loss function stabilizes is also the phase when the local loss is stabilized. So there is a correlation between the two properties, which is uh, very mysterious at this point. We don't know why that happens. Okay. Uh, to summarize what I was saying in the, about local elasticity, we say that neural dynamics has two properties. One is of uh, locality and one is of two phases. Uh, and the question is how much of this is true? Can you come up with function classes where elasticity function is uh, local and it has two phases? This kind of proof for neural functions is currently still outside the mathematical reach, but we can come up with model uh, toy problem functions. I won't call them really toy problems, but they're little model functions which have neural-like behavior. And that's the story of what I call, uh, what we are calling degree to NTK functions. So I don't know how much time I have. So I guess I have just a couple of minutes left. Uh, in principle, yes, but I think you don't have that many slides. So I think that you can continue. I can continue. Okay. Yeah, for the next probably you know, 10, 15 minutes, that will be perfectly fine. Okay. So. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So we don't know how to prove this kind of locality uh, and other properties of uh, neural network uh, for elasticity function. So we try to come up with nice function classes which might behave neurally, at least from the point of view of elasticity. And one function class that we have uh, come up with, which we think models neural behavior in a, to some extent, is this function class that I call the degree to NTK functions. There's a history to why the naming, I will get to it slowly. So what you can see that what this function does is it takes a matrix as input, uh, it takes a matrix parameterization W and an input X, and it computes alpha of X, some scalar function, plus and sum of inner products. And the inner products are over beta R of X. So beta R are some scalar valued, uh, vector valued functions uh, from X to uh, some RL. Inner product with WR to the power of D. WR is the Rth row of the matrix W. And what I mean by vector to the power of D is uh, coordinates wise power into D. So this is a like Hadamard power. So D is Hadamard power of the vector WR. Uh, so these are polynomials. So that's one good thing. And if you look at the special case of this class of functions for D equal to one, and alpha x and beta r's being chosen in a particular way, where beta r is the, suppose you chose the beta r as a gradient of the neural function at the initial point of a training process. And if you chose the alpha r as the value at, of the function at initialization, minus the gradient at initialization, inner product with the current weight at initialization. If you, if you make this particular choice of d, alpha, and beta, then this class of functions will reduce to a certain famous class of functions called the neural tangent kernel functions. If I, if I might call it the neural tangent kernel functions. And we believe at this point that if you take any sequence of neural networks of increasing size, that sequence of functions almost always probably converges to this class of functions, which are the neural tangent kernel functions. I don't think it has been proven completely rigorously in a very universal sense, but all the proofs that exist today lead us to believe that probably every possible way of taking a sequence of neural nets of increasing size will eventually converge to this neural tangent kernel functions. But the neural tangent kernel functions are linear in the weights because they would have d equal to one. And if you go back to the definition of elasticity, we'll realize that if I use a linear function, a function which is linear in weights and a squared loss, then local elasticity function will collapse to a constant. But we know from real experiments that the elasticity function that we have been looking at is not constant on actual neural training. So that's one way to see that actual neural training is the neural nets that are actually getting trained are very far conceptually from the asymptotic limit of large neural nets. So writing theories about asymptotic large neural nets is probably not the best idea out there. And why? And here is one way to see it. Because here is a clear function which distinguishes between finite nets and asymptotically large nets. So we need something nonlinear. Definitely we need nonlinearity in the weights to get any non-trivial properties of the neural nets we reproduce to the toy model. So one way I introduce nonlinearity is to look at DF Hadamard power of the weights. And we write down what I would call the gradient flow dynamics. So what is the gradient flow dynamics is DDT of the weights equal to minus the partial derivative of the flow weight of the risk function, where the risk function is a squared loss on my 
uh, function class. Y minus the prediction of the function class that x squared and expectation of the data particular to degree phase. So I'm training them by gradient flow, which is a reasonable thing to do because essentially SGD and all in a sense are discretizations of gradient flow. So why not just go to the ODE level and write theory there where it's somewhat easier. And the interesting thing is that this is a very complicated set of complicated coupled system of ODEs which are vector, which are vectorial and coupled, very hard to solve them. But there are analytic limits here you can take under certain distributional assumptions. If I assume the distribution is such that the beta functions are diagonally orthogonal and certain moments are finite, then what I can do is essentially decouple. And once I can decouple the system of OTs, I can look at special cases where and get exact solution of the OD system. And when I can get the exact solution, I can write down this well as a function of time exact. And you can get this particular function. Uh, is it possible to get this kind of closed form expressions for the elasticity function on other function classes or more general cases, even inside this function class? That's clearly open. And uh, I think it's an important direction of research. But why are these closed forms important? I don't know if it's obvious to anyone in the audience as to what the shape of this function is by looking at this complicated expression. At least not obvious to me. So I plotted it. When you plot it, you get these blue curves that as time progresses, they have this neural-like two-phase behavior where there is a phase where it is increasing and there is a phase where this is stabilizing. And this behavior that the blue curve is the, what the gradient flow predicts is very close to the actual behavior of SGD on that function class, which is the red curve. So it is internally consistent that the behavior of elasticity on SGD on the function class, which is the red curve, is very closely reproduced by the gradient flow behavior on the same function class. So there is internal consistency. And this kind of internal consistency provokes us to conjecture that maybe uh, the limit of eta tends to zero of the SRL on gradient flow is actually the true behavior of SRL on SGD, and which is a meta conjecture out there, which we don't know how to prove at this point. But this kind of plots clearly motivate that conjecture. That we don't know how to compute this red curve, the behavior of SRL on SGD. But gradient flow seems to be very close, actually. And it has a neural problem. So this motivated that this is probably a good model of neural network. And you can try out with other function classes, other parameter settings, and you'll see that this keeps happening again and again. It's always internally consistent, and it has a two-phase behavior, one rising phase and an asymptotically stable phase, which is, I think, the hallmark of neural training. Neural training goes to two phases, a rising phase of elasticity and an asymptotically stable phase of elasticity. And this two-phase behavior is something I believe is very critical to explain because it seems universal. Any data you take, any neural net you take, any method of training you take, as long as you start from initial, as long as you start from random initialization, this is one property that will be recovered again and again, I believe, over all experiments. At this point, my belief is pretty strong that over all experiments, this diagram can be reproduced. So here is an example of a universal property of neural network. So it's an important question of what will mathematically model. So I would like to end with a set of bunch of open questions. One is uh, understanding this elasticity function. I believe, and if you think about the uh, elasticity function of neural networks that I've been talking about a uh, little carefully, if you go back home and try computing, you realize it's mathematically very challenging. It's, it's mathematically very hard to control this function. But there is one can't rule out that maybe this function can be simplified to something else, which still gets you the correct two-phase problems and the other intuitions that you want to have. So a simplified notion of elasticity, which is mathematically more tractable without losing the important properties, I think is an important direction and maybe this is possible. Second question is a full ODE system. Like we don't know what the full ODE is doing. I took a very interesting special case of it essentially to get analytic control. But maybe the full ODE has more structure in it. The full uh, and more structured, which might be more closer to neural networks. And that's, I think, an important direction to understand, simulate this, or somehow analyze this OD system to see what it's doing. In a sense, alpha and beta are the two parameters here which sees the neural network. So what you want, ideally, is a prescription that by looking at the training data and the neural network, you'll be able to tell me what the alpha and the beta functions should be so that this OD reproduces the neural behavior. But we don't have, at this point, a very good prescription of giving the alpha and beta function by just looking at the neural network. 
this is alpha and beta, I would like to say, as I uh, the analysis that I began with of Navier Stokes equation, it's like pressure and density. Like we know how to measure pressure and density of a fluid, and once you can measure the pressure and density of a fluid, you can write down the Navier Stokes quadrant. This is analogously here is alpha and beta function. We really don't know at this point how to come up. We don't have a measurement technique for the alpha and beta functions given a neural network. And maybe if you could come up with something like that, you could plug that into this OD, and this OD will tell you what the neural net does. It's an alternative view of what the neural net does. It's a potentially possible fix, which I don't know if it is true completely at this point. But I've given you hopefully some reasons to believe why this might be true. In particular, I would uh, strongly motivate the audience to look into this paper, archive 1910.01619. This is a very interesting paper that came out in 2019, late 2019, which sort of gave a systematic way to move from asymptotically large nets towards finite nets. They essentially did a perturbation theory about infinite nets. That's one way to think of what they were doing. And they said you can perturbatively get to finite nets by starting from infinite nets. And how do you do this perturbative uh, analysis? They did this analysis in this paper. If you look at the, fun as the functions they eventually came up with in this perturbative way of thinking, which they said are better approximates of neural nets at second order at compared to the infinite limit. Essentially, roughly that's what they did. If you look at those functions, you would see that they're structurally very similar to the particular function class that I have analyzed here. So I believe there is a deeper connection between the function class in which I have analyzed to come up with the SRL uh, behavior, to reproduce SRL behavior and show uh, neural uh, reproduce some of the neural behavior of SRL through toy models. This function class and the function class that was more rigorously derived in this paper, starting from perturbatively expanding about the infinite sort of. It's likely that there is a relationship between them. Maybe the two functions have similarity in looks. Maybe there are closely related. Maybe one can reproduce this entire gradient flow theory, this entire SRL theory for their function class and get more accurate results. It's a possibility to investigate further. I think it's a very important thing to think about. Uh, question three that I would motivate is gradient flows. I think gradient flow is a very important question to uh, analyze. This particular class of gradient flows uh, is what models most of uh, learned machine learning. Almost all of machine learning can be said to be some way or the other understanding these gradient flows. Uh, and this kind of gradient flows, uh, to the best of my knowledge, has not been uh, understood well enough. There's very little theory I know of. As far as I have heard, there's very little theory which tells me when would this gradient flow converge to the global minimum. In this kind of a question, we don't seem to have a good answer to at this point. And coming up, if I am right, if I'm right that this is not known, which I believe at this point, as far as I've searched, then I think it's an important direction of further research to understand this particular class of gradient flows and to show case by case that okay, this will converge to global minimum of this function. And hopefully for the neural case, if one can show that would be very interesting. The last question I'd like to motivate is something way more ambitious than everything I've said so far, I would say, is what I'd call deep equilibrium model. So what is a deep equilibrium model? So this is, there has been this understanding for now since the beginning that neural nets gain when you increase the depth, the deeper nets somehow tend to do better than shallower nets. If this is really true, the deeper nets keep doing better, then why not just keep increasing the depth to infinity? Why not define neural nets at infinity? Maybe they will have a weirdly large advantage over everything you can think of. But can you define neural nets at infinity? Is it possible? So here is a mechanism how to do it. Let's focus on neural nets, which are autoencoders. My favorite kind of neural nets are autoencoders. So what I mean by an autoencoder is neural nets which have the same input dimension and output dimension. So neural nets mapping FW of Rn to Rn. So if the input and the output dimension match, I'm calling an autoencoder. And let's think of the sequence of vectors as starting from a Z0, I'm going to do FW of Z0 to get Z1, FW of Z1 to get Z2, and I keep getting a sequence of vectors like this by iteratively applying the function. Now, it turns out that there are possible cases where this sequence of the sequence of vectors will actually converge to a fixed point. 
So if it converges to a fixed point, then it's reasonable to say that that fixed point value is the output of an infinitely deep neural network on the input x. And what is the infinite net? It is that neural network FW, which is a finite net. FW is a finite net, but composing neural nets on one on top of the other is still a neural net. FW of FW is a neural net of depth twice that of FW, and so on and so forth. So if the fixed point exists of as applying FW infinite number of times, then it's reasonable to say that the fixed point is the output of an infinitely deep neural network on the input X. So here is a mechanism to define infinitely deep neural networks. What now happens is this. Suppose I have, I'm getting X comma Y pair, data looks like X comma Y, supervised learning, where the label Y is some linear transform of X star. And a very classic question, sparse coding, as I uh, talked of sparse coding at the beginning of the talk also, is to say that given, uh, oh, sorry, uh, this is not sparse coding, this is a little more simpler than that, this is compressed sensing essentially, but not really compressed sensing because A is not the standard lead transform as you use in programming. So, so given Y and A, I want to recover X star. Now, there's a very classic line of research in compressed sensing by Terence Tao, Emmanuel Candice, Justin Tromberg, David Donohoe from 2005 and six, uh, which is like a breakthrough research by Terence Tao and others, who were able to show that there are cases of A and A such that knowing Y and A, you can uniquely get back X star. There is a unique X star and you can get back X star uh, in time, uh, polynomial time, when A is not invertible. So if A is invertible matrix, then Recovering X star is, is a no brainer. It's just summary, solving simultaneous equations. Everybody knows how to do it. Question is when A is not invertible, are there still scenarios when X star can be uniquely recovered? There is a unique X star can be recovered. And then the famous result of Terence Tau and others was that yes, there are such cases. And but the kind of A's they used, one might say is restrictive. We seem to believe from modern neural experiments that. Actually, this inversion it holds more generally than just the class at which Tau Candice Rombok Donohu worked. And that seems to come from the viewpoint of infinitely deep neural networks. That if you pass, if you start the infinitely deep neural network at the point A transpose Y, then the fixed point could be very close to X star. There is increasing experimental evidence to suggest that this is probably true. And it's probably true even in more general cases where Y and X star are not so easily related. Here, Y and X star, I'm assuming you have an easy relationship between them. Maybe if uh, this relationship is more complicated than just a linear relationship, it still holds. That you can start from Y and some information about the A and pass it through an infinite net network and recover X star. We are not sure if this is true, but this is likely to be true if we are interpreting certain neural experiments correctly. So we have neural experiments at this point which seem to give, give us this belief. And this is what is called a deep equilibrium model. This is one way to think about deep equilibrium model. We have recently submitted a funding proposal for this research with Rebecca Willett at UU Chicago. So hope we get funding to do this research, but uh, this is a very interesting uh, question. I'm very fascinated by this idea of infinite nets. If, if, if really with uh, if depth really gives you an advantage, why not just push it to the limit and let's see what happens. Okay, so that's the end of my talk. I have gone overboard by 15 minutes. So there are some paper references if you want to look up more results of ours. Uh, questions. Thank you. Okay. No, thank you very much for a very, very interesting presentation. And uh, yeah, kind of it was more on the side of like how to prove the certain results for the neural networks. But I think not all of our participants were students. Many of our participants are postdocs. And I think they were, in particular, they would benefit from the talks like that. Because like on the physics side, it was very nice to see the connection between structures like neural networks and the possible physics approaches, like you mentioned, and then related to the Navier's talks and so on. Uh, I do not see any questions right now. So if any participants have a questions, they're welcome to raise their hands and they will give them the right to talk. Uh, 
Uh, but in that case, uh, well, people, I think maybe I can ask you a question because, you know, when you were talking about this analogy of the process of the training of the neural network with the, some sort of the phase transition so that when you have a two, two regimes in training of the neural network, are you aware of the works of the South African scientists uh, called Robert de Mello Koch? And they were looking on the training of the deep neural networks from the kind of standard phase transition mathematics apparatus, which is called the normalization group theory. Okay, I have not seen this work. I have not seen this work. Okay, okay. I, I would be happy if you can just send me the reference, I would be happy to have a look. Um, okay, okay, uh, yes, because like uh, Vishnu should know about him because they are colleagues in the same university. Um, but I mean, recently, and also on the Mitex YouTube channel, there is a there is a recording of his talk, so you can just Okay. Uh, look through, but I mean, they they were looking like, can you can you see it? Like, I mean, the process of training as a certain renormalization group flows, and can you make some relationship? Because there is like well developed mathematical apparatus of how to describe phase transitions, at least in the certain classes of problems. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we we believe there are. I mean, it's possible that there are multiple ways of seeing this phases of a neural training. Uh, Possible that S uh, it's possible that SRL is not the only such uh, parameter out there. SRL is one parameter which detects a phase behavior. Uh, it's not clear, like there could be multiple uh, such parameters which are detecting phase behaviors. And it's important to understand which one sort of is more conceptually interpretable. The question of interpretability is very important here because one of the reasons why this SRL is uh, getting, it's sort of interesting is it catches one important interpretation, which is that suppose you're doing classification experiments between cats and dog pictures. If you sample a cat image and do an update in the algorithm, does it change the predictions of the dog image? And this is not obvious, at least to me, that it will change or won't change. But when you see from this perspective, it turns out that it does not change too much. So neural networks understand classification in a very human way that when you update using one class of images it does not too much affect the prediction on the other class and this conceptual grouping of data is something that we believe is a very important neural property and this phase behavior here is trying to capture that uh, conceptual grouping uh, this will take some more effort to get into because uh, I did not get into the issue of classification experiments of SRL. If I want to do this kind of velocity kind of uh, theory with classification experiments, I have to use a more complicated SRL definition. This SRL definition that I've shown in this talk is very tuned to the regression experiment. In the classification case, things get a little more complicated. And that's, uh, that's where sort of things are headed. So there is a more complicated version of elasticity function that is more tuned to classification. And then you can see this locality, which is distance locality in this picture becomes conceptual locality in some sense. That images which are close to each other conceptually are affected in one way and differently from images which are conceptually closer to each other and different. So, so elasticity is sort of tuned to get that conceptual clustering correct. So yeah, it could be possible that there are other notions of phase behaviors which see some other data structure correctly. It's, there is no way I would say is one unique. That's okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, I don't see any questions. And take into account that we went a little bit over time. Uh, I think I can pass it down to Francesco and he can wrap up the today's session. Yeah, no, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, Anir, thank you so much for a really nice uh, talk. I only heard the last 20 minutes because uh, unfortunately I couldn't make it from, from the beginning. So thank you very much for, for your time and, uh, and for sharing uh, uh, your knowledge uh, with us in, in, uh, in, the, in this mini school. Mm -hmm. uh, I also need to thank Ilya who, who took over <laughs> the, the, the responsibility of, uh, of introducing you and of course also Palab and, uh, and, and, and Vishnu uh, who, who are part of your machine learning team. So thank you so much.
and I guess I will see everybody again uh, next week at the same time in the same place uh, with the same Zoom link for, for part three of the, of the course. So thank you very much uh, again. And um, yeah, and all of you have a good uh, rest of the day. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.